Howdy, folks. Welcome to Rutsu Talk, episode 33, a return to palindrome form. Wow. And, uh, yeah. It's going to be 11 more before that happens. Uh, I know, I'm already missing it. <laughs> so, it's the middle of the day. We're recording on Tuesday. Very last minute. We tend to put these up on Tuesday. Wednesday, you mean? Oh, no, Tuesday. You're right. Yeah, we put them on Lipson first and then YouTube. Yeah, because you're supposed to listen to it on audio only. Well, that's Podcasts apparently... don't belong on video websites, but people want it there also. Well, people have, you know, uh, video-based podcasts, too, where they point cameras at themselves and you can watch them talk, in case you don't believe it's actually them or something. Mm. Should we start doing that? I'm, I'm pretty ugly. I have a mannequin I can use. Okay. And poke it with a stick whenever I talk. <laughs> Because I'm pretty shy myself. I like that. Maybe some sort of puppet-based podcast where you just tap the head up and down every now and again. Yeah, yeah. have a yeah. little sock puppet. I have a giant body pillow of from Dante from Devil May Cry. The old Ooh. one, of course, I mean. Mm. You know, that, and it's that not too crusty? Work. No, not too crusty. And it could invite yeah. you to the party whenever that's happening. Hmm. Speaking of, someone mentioned to me that they thought the Devil May Cry games are wrong prayable. Your thoughts, having played them? Um, I don't know. I was wrong on Harvester. Uh, I really didn't think that was too wrong prayable, but um, but the people seem to enjoy it so far. You know, Devil May Cry is. I think it might go better with that theater mode treatment, if anything. You know, like yeah, that was kind of what I was thinking. Just are the cutscenes alone laughable? Right, yeah, oh, well, yeah. I think Devil May Cry 2, especially, because, um, so I really like the first Devil May Cry game a lot. Like, that's, I think, my favorite out of the trilogy. Uh, mm. and the, the second one, I couldn't tell you what I did or why I did it in terms of the story. I, I just had, I had no idea what was going on, even at a basic level. So it's like my thoughts on Harvester so far. Well, yeah, except you're supposed to think that about Harvester. Okay. Uh, so you think that was the Harvester design philosophy? As far actually, as the story goes? Are you on my opinion? Because I've been thinking a lot about Harvester, obviously watching it again and, you know, thinking more about the grander story of it. Um, it seems to be some sort of commentary on... Well, it came out in 96 after Orrin Hatch and Joe Lieberman were kind of doing this um, anti-violent video game crusade, you know, mostly due to Mortal Kombat in 91, 92, you know? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, Harvester is, is some kind of response to that. I don't know if I could quite tell you exactly what the response is. I I, I think it's, it, it is more, I'll give it more credit, I don't think it was just sort of a cash-in on let's just make a really gory fucking game. With a lot of kind of a muddled response, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's the thing because it's not quite clear where it's going. It, it doesn't seem as though it it's condemning violent video games, being that it is one, right? Uh, so I think it's more of a commentary on it in a way. It's hard to talk about not knowing the ending and all that, but you know, this is the clearest way I can say <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> it's um, you'll understand why, right? But uh, yeah. What are you thinking of the game so far? By the time we post this, uh, we'll be, I think, midway or most of the way through the session that we did, the hour-long one. Right, which is days three through six. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah, that's... And if, if I had been playing the game myself to the point where the, game, where the long play is now that we're watching, I probably would have given up on it. Mm -hmm. But knowing that you've been saying it gets a lot better or it gets a lot more interesting it's really piqued my curiosity so i i can't say better i mean you've mostly seen what the game has to offer it's just that it it gets the content it offers is more interesting in that way the direction that it goes in i suppose so i mean you've seen you know you, you will take rough uh rough rider or range rider excuse me uh the cowboy guy remember mm -hmm. him and then he's oh he, yeah his guy is like stepping in the Indian and all that, and yeah, my favorite character so far. Absolutely, and yeah. uh, then you see him horrifically burned. Yes, which is kind of unexpected. 
it does things like that where it comes back and makes things you've seen weirder and adds new crazy things on top of it, basically. Hmm. You're not going to know what's around the next corner, I guess. Is probably yeah, that's why I feel like it's kind of, you've asked me a couple of times what I think is going to happen, and I almost feel like it's kind of pointless to speculate given that I feel like it's just going to go in some completely random place that I would never be able to guess in a million years, so what's the point of even trying to rationalize a probably irrational story, unrational story? It's it's guessable. It's not going to be... It's not like a Killer7 thing where you would analyze everything. It has a fairly clear answer. Uh, I, w- I would okay. be a little surprised if you did get it, because it is kind of out there in a way. Um, obviously, I don't want to say too much. Um, but I liked, I mean, I liked your latest theory. What was it, like a Wicker Man kind of thing? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, because, I mean, it makes the most sense, given that everybody's calling Steve a kidder, and, mm-hmm. you know, you're amnesia, come on. So it's, the closest parallel I can think of was my favorite film, Nicolas Cage's Wicker Man. <laughs> I've still never and seen it. You should. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you at least seen the highlights of the film on YouTube? Oh, well, yeah. No, it Okay, looks- so you have seen it. It looks completely great. You know that movie was a remake, apparently. Yes, yes. Of a far inferior version. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming. I think I think on one of those days I am gonna have to sit down and watch The Wicker Man. It's uh it's one of those cult movies, as they call it now. Yes, something you need to watch ironically. Mm-hmm. And I think if Harvester had gotten more press, it probably would have been a cult game, you know. Both in the Let's Play and the Strong... I mean, people. it holds people's interest, certainly. You know. But we do have a couple of uh, guests lined up. We do. Yeah. After the uh, success you had with Total Biscuit. So it's good, a good cast, by the way. Nice job keeping it cash with British folks who are usually such I, up to tight little fucks. <laughs> with the exception of Mr. DJB. Um, you're mm. right. But no, uh, it was fun. Um, it's funny, though, because... Listening, you put together the audio for that podcast, so yes. I didn't listen back to it. But then when I heard the finished product and how much clearer and crisper his voice was than mine, um, yeah, now I'm obsessed with audio because yeah, and you've gotten me thinking about it too. I it's 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 what I like to call good envy, where you look at something mm. that someone else has and you say, I want that, and you're not gonna you know, kidnap them or anything to get it. Wait, I could You're kidnap not? him. Shit, he's in America. Mm-hmm. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Okay. So but, just a train ride away? <laughs> regardless. But, I mean, he has very expensive equipment. Uh, but still, I mean, the stuff he did to his audio that he told me about doesn't require, you know, thousands of dollars in hardware or something. He ran compressors on it. He uh, used noise gates. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. That's his method, you know, so other people I've talked to don't like noise gates, they like noise floors, there's some, I don't think anyone likes envelopes, I think that's kind of a low-tech way of doing it, but... I'm uh, more into noise walls. (laughs) I, well, I I actually had a phone call, no joke, with Lotax uh, yesterday, (laughs) when he tried to walk me through good audio stuff, (laughs) Uh, but, like, apparently there's a difference between volume and loudness, which is Does Lotax use one of those old timey nineteen sixties phones that makes him sound weird? He actually uh has a machine. He types in an old nineteen forties Olympus typewriter hooked up mm. to a human heart that outputs speech for him. He has no so, mouth. And he I must damn help it, you. I you know, I stopped right there because I'm like, I don't wanna say the scream thing, and then there you go. Always always with that low hanging fruit. Thanks for nothing. Podcast over. Slow beef, use noise gates. <laughs> um, I think the tricky thing about audio for me is there's a, uh, a quantitative aspect to it, which I understand, but then there's a practical aspect to it, which is where I get tripped up. As in you need to be able to hear what is good? Yeah, or um, like the first Or thing- being a bad judge of what is good? Right. So you have equalizers, which take all the frequency bands and let you adjust them. And I didn't understand what the curves were, what they were doing, but I've learned a little more now. So human speech tends to be, or men, that is, tend to be, I think, about 160 hertz, if I remember correctly. So that's the band you kind of either leave, you want to boost a little, if I remember correctly. Uh, And women's speech, you know, they they tend to speak higher, tends to be uh, uh, 200 hertz. 
Oh, come on, women. I mean, they got his beat on the hurts. You got to give him that. As if they didn't hurts me enough. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, please Kickstarter my Tropes versus Women in Audio movie mm-hmm. coming out soon on YouTube. Um, yep. But anyway, any, everything in the low range is typically background noise, and you want to drop all that. A thousand hertz is where you start to sound nasally, and he Lotax likes to do a thing called a notch filter, where you bring that part he, of the curve. He plays Minecraft? That's exactly it. On his audio? The yeah. audio sounds very QB and block-like, and there's always, mm-hmm. always someone talking over it. Mm. Occasionally, someone will put an anime girl in for God knows what reason. With inexplicably tens of thousands of likes. That reminds me, just a quick aside. Do you remember that girlfriend mod for Amnesia? That, for Amnesia? That, excuse me, for Minecraft? <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me more about the Amnesia girlfriend. <laughs> I was also thinking there is... Instead of attacking you, the monsters come up and hug you. <laughs> you have to woo them with, you know, really good lantern placement, I suppose. I don't know anything yeah. about meeting women. Um, Lighting is key for romance, right. and Amnesia does that so well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, no, no, no. Uh, there, it's like this mod of Minecraft where when the monster comes up to you, it gets replaced with an anime girl kind of dressed up like that monster. Was that the one we talked to? No, that was the QB women one. Is this an actual, this, we were like, gonna, actual anime JPEGs? If I remember, we were going to talk over it, but you were too creeped out for a too Oh, of it. yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that one was pretty skeevy. Yeah. <laughs> and I, again, that, that just brings me back to why do you need that in Minecraft, is, of all things? It is pretty skeevy, and it is pretty my homepage. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. The, Definitely. The reason I said Amnesia, too, is because um, there's also an Amnesia Minecraft mod, which was... The Dark Descent into Pussy? <laughs> Not, no, no, no. Not an Amnesia Minecraft uh, Girlfriend mod. That's oh. that's too many tastes at once. That's that's like peanut butter, Sorry. chocolate, and crack. I mean, come on. Um, no, it sounds like a real machine for pigs. <laughs> um, the Amnesia Minecraft mod tries to make Minecraft into Amnesia, and I was watching a scare camp let's player. He's like, I don't know, this isn't scary yet. You don't see a lot of scary Minecraft mods, and it's like, no, <laughs> no, you don't. That's odd. maybe there's a reason for that. Yeah. yeah. You can't figure why that figure out why that market isn't quite saturated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we were talking about audio. Yes. Yeah. So I, I uh, so um, as far as I understand it, I mean compression takes the whole wave, and it's supposed to push down the high parts and bring up the low parts. Because the idea is, if you waver too fast between high and low, you subtly annoy uh, the listener. You know, like, you, you can't really hear it in your head, but it's like something varies too much. It's like a pain in the ass. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah in, the, in the past, what I've done when I've put our audio together, instead of compressing, I would just listen through the whole thing and manually de-amplify peaks or bring up the lows. Yeah, I, see, I don't even do that because I could never really, I never knew what I was listening for, and I still kind of don't. I do with the amplify thing, but with compress the compressor, I can never quite get the setting just right. So, let's actually show me too. Audacity doesn't do this, which sucks, but um, Audition kind of does, and SoundForge does. But what you can do is, if you set up your compressor, um, if you use a multi-band compressor, meaning it like works on the major frequency bands, you can watch, and the idea is, as they peak, if one of them goes red, it means it's hit the compressor, and the compressor will change that. So the idea is, if you uh, do compression, when you look at it after the fact... The wave should change very minorly, or, or I mean, it should change, you know? And uh, the idea is if you have one of those visual compressors, it shows you where it's changed. You can see exactly what parts of the audio it wants to bring down. Because you, you don't want to compress something and have the whole thing be like a rectangle, you know, nor do you want to just do nothing and only very subtly change it. You want it to look kind of like a very, from a very spiky wave to a little squashed more like a triangle, but remember that the lower parts be, get brought up too. I think this is probably all garbage that, information and I'm just leading everyone astray. How do you learn about all this stuff? I think, well, I mean, low is like, look, it took me years and professional audio engineers. It takes them like years and years and years. Like you really have to study it. Hmm. But I mean, cause there's all sorts of things, right? Cause there's the amplitude of your wave, the frequency of it. And then there, there, that's the whole quantitative part of it. Right. And there's things like the threshold and then attack to case sustain release. And then, 
there's the qualitative part, the practical part of it, where you say how it actually affects your voice. Because I think it's best if your compressor, the one you use, is tailored to your voice, you know? Hmm. Like, we, you and I could probably get a general purpose compressor at some point that'll make us both sound better, but at the end of the day, you know, obviously we have different voices, and I probably need a better or a different compressor than you, you know? Uh, I'll say. Well, uh, probably. I don't know how I would do But the thing is, too, it's hard to know the language, because he was telling me, like, about when, like, uh, audio runs hot, Meaning it goes into the red zone or it goes above a decibel level. Scores a touchdown. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there's decibel levels, which I'm not 100% sure on what decibels. That's just are. loudness, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess it's a measure of loudness. But um, he was telling me, like, your microphone setting, you don't want to go above negative eight decibels when you're actually recording. So, like, I'm watching the peaks now, and I have gone above uh, negative eight actually in this. So, oh. well, let's start over. <laughs> I guess I need a noise gate, uh, but um, you need, there's some kind of limiter, like a noise gate or a noise floor or a noise ceiling. It's like these limiters that say, don't ever let the audio go up past this. You're making it sound like I have to construct a special room to record in. <laughs> that, All right, bring up the noise floor there, that, the noise wall and carpet in. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, I wish there was like an, an Audacity plugin that was just like, fix my voice, you know, and that was it. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's apparently just so different for everyone. Well, it's the thing, too, with, yeah. like, men's voices and women's voices, that, like, th there are different frequencies that they tend to hit, you know? Oh! Well, there you go. See? And, well, that's the shitty thing for me, too, is I have a weird... I don't want to say range, because that makes it sound like a good thing. It's it's more like, um... You're more all over the place. That's the th exactly right. Because sometimes you get like this when you're talking about this. Usually like when I'm asking a question. Um... <laughs> I don't get like that. That's see, that there's no amount of processing that's gonna fix that. You just in mark, fact, I'm just noise removing that. You just you just delete that. Mm. <laughs> this, this has been an idiot's guide to audio processing by Red Supre. Um Yeah. Well, the very at the very least, you want to do noise removal, which um, in Audacity Correct. is simple enough, you know. But there's so the workflow. The way I understand it is you do the noise removal, mm -hmm. you compress it, mm -hmm. and then you are also playing with equalization. I think that's about... With mixed results. That's where you have to really know what you're doing. Yeah. I think starting out, just worry about noise filter and compression. I'm going to play with an equalizer because I have the curve kind of where I'm liking it. Um, oh, the other tricky thing is you and I have stereo mics. Yes. Technically, so if you set them to stereo, which I think mine is right now... You know, Minus my, two. Yeah, mine's a little at an angle, so my right channel right now is slightly booster, boosted a little slightly more than my left, just because of the way the microphone's positioned. So, like, actually, while we're doing this, I'm watching the little bars in Audacity, you know? And uh, to that end, you always want to, like, convert to mono, because th there's not really any great point to stereo voice, unless you're in a video game or something, and you want to... But it's in stereo! Right. Unless you want to do some cute thing where, like, I'm in your left ear, and, you know, you're in their right ear, you know? Which... I accidentally did that in my old Let's Plays. Did you? Yeah. It was cut in whatever the, uh, what was called, Pretty May? The old Skype call recording thing that was the <laughs> Let's Play hit back in the day? I thought you were... It would, it would do just that. I thought you were going to say Pretty Maid, like you, like, Let's Played some <laughs> weird anime maid game. <laughs> That was a Skype plug-in back in the day. For sexy anime yeah. maids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And they gave me mono. <laughs> so. I understand. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so I'm still learning it. Um, but uh, the big mistake we made with... Uh, or I made, I should say, with uh, Processing Harvester, uh, these past three episodes, seven through nine, is I saved my original recording as MP3, and then you gave me MP3. But once you've exported to MP3, since it's lossy... You might have lost already a lot of audio data you could have used. So, hmm. you know, which makes sense now that I think about it. But it's like, uh, so if you save as WAV or obviously the original, whatever program you're using, like that project file, it should have as much data as it has, you know. I did not know that. Yeah. Interesting. Mm hmm Unfortunately, I just realized, too, I'm not recording in the settings low tax recommended, which was, uh, I think, 48,000 hertz. Maybe I'm wrong there. Whatever. I'm I'm at forty four one hundred. It's a learning process. I'm there too. Yeah. But we'll we'll we're gonna try some of these audio processing tricks on this podcast, maybe. 
Maybe. Maybe. Let's see what we can whip up. Yeah. Maybe stick with the basics of noise removal and compression, see if there's a noticeable difference. Absolutely, yeah. Because I got mixed reviews on Harvester, and I think I think the reason is because certain things were better, but certain things were worse. I, I And you ran the equalization on that one, right? Yeah, I did. Um, and yeah. what happens, though, is if you quash... As far as I'm understanding, if you quash a large amplitude too much, it'll make it sound tinnier. You know, like canned. You know what I mean? Like, you ever hear that? Like, like you're talking through a tunnel? Yeah, you, you've probably heard that yeah. kind of thing, you know? It's like like when somebody... All the time! It. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see what happens, I guess. Speaking of um, the podcast and guests, we have a couple <laughs> of guests lined up for next week. Yeah. Lotex said he would be interested in hanging. Yeah, he'd, he'd be standing behind both of us and telling us what we're doing wrong as we're recording our podcast. Well, that could also be that you could have an expert talk about it rather than us just bullshitting. Um, but yeah, he said to be on. He asked if we wanted Schmorky, and I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, whatever. Definitely. The the people have demanded the return of Schmorky for the longest time since he was on Red Supre back in the day. I always felt weird asking him because you know what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, I get you. You know, but now that uh, now that we've made the big time, I don't care. No, uh, <laughs> but you know he should be requesting us. <laughs> no, he should not. He is so oh. much more talented than I will ever be. Um, <laughs> you know what's funny though is after the total biscuit thing, I listened to a bit of the podcast on my way into work, and we had talked about Northern Lion, who's another popular YouTube Let's Player, who has yeah, he's the Infinity Parts Binding of Isaac Let's Player. I believe he just released part 614 today. That's 614. Um, of one playthrough. Right. Uh, but Very we, slow. He, uh, and he guested on Total Biscuits Podcast. And I did, just thought randomly, I was in this meeting, I was like, I wonder if you'd want to guest on our podcast. Keep in mind, I'm not like, I don't really watch a lot of his videos at all. I don't even know what the fuck I would talk to him about. But I just mm -hmm. had that thought, and then someone else on Twitter said to him, like, you should be on Red Supreme's podcast, and I was like, that's so weird, I just thought that. And he's like, yeah, sure, whatever, so we're trying to schedule all that. And I'm trying to figure out what the fuck I would talk to him about. So that'll be a fun, awkward time. Absolutely. I also, it's kind of funny, you when you were searching around for advice, like, I think just YouTube videos on how to make yourself sound better on Destiny, you found a video from him. Yeah, I did. That was actually pretty funny. I yeah, I tweeted that. That was very good. Yeah. Except it, yeah. it wasn't the real information, so screw you. Um, Northern lying. <laughs> you know that we've had a few requests for people too who I want to bring on that I've you know, like I know the dark kid told me once like he'd like to come on, so I'd love to have him. Research indicates guy who did trespasser back in the day. Mm -hmm. Another guy I'd like to have on. Likewise, Proteus. Proteus, I guess. Well, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I love that for yeah. a time. We got to get Blister back. We had him. We had a great conversation with him, but uh, I fucked up toward the end, like when somebody had to come in and assess our condo and things like that. It was a nightmare. So, mm -hmm. you know, we ended up having to scrap that one. But I'd love to have him back. There's so many people to talk to. Could have Baldrick on and talk about Let's Play Archive Administration. I would, yeah. There are so many more people that are more interesting than we are, is what I'm kind of getting. What I want is for all of you to start your own podcast and have us guest on them. <laughs> and that'd be more interesting than this. I Well, that's called viral marketing, you know, where it spreads like a virus. Hmm. 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 You know what video game features virus spreading? <laughs> Oh no, what video game <laughs> featured virus spreading? It's a little indie hit called The Last of Us. The Last of Us? Why, well, I hear you, you're playing that. I actually just finished the game a few hours ago. What did you think of The Last of Us? It was an amazing gaming experience. And after I was done, I thought a bit about what you were saying about that game, Brothers, which I haven't played yet. Mm hmm but probably have similar views on as far as the Let's Play angle of it. And I don't think The Last of Us is something that you can probably make a good Let's Play out of it. Okay. But I don't think it would behoove you, I don't think it would behoove anyone to watch a Let's Play of The Last of Us. I really, really think it's a game you have to play and experience for yourself because the game world, the game setting, 
the gameplay, it's all so immersive. Like, it'll give you anxiety, it'll make your heart race, and it's really something that you have to be holding that controller and playing for yourself to really get everything out of, I think. Do you th- and on top of that, the story and such is top-notch. Do you feel there's a market for, let's say, people who have already played the game watching someone re-experience it? Uh, I don't know. It's a very, very linear game. It has collectibles, and you can you know give some basic upgrades to your weapons. But unless you really want to know where, hey, where are all the pendants or all the um, all the comic books, which are collectible things you can get in the game, unless you're really curious about where those are, I don't see. Maybe if you felt like you rushed through the game at points, because there are some very subtle details and things in the environments that. Maybe you could miss. Mm-hmm. That might be worth going back to. So, I don't know. I, I Iffy, but maybe. Do you feel like I should go in? Cause you've kind of convinced me I should check this out. Um, yes. Do you feel like I should go in cold? Because I really don't know much about it. I mean, in fact, when you just mentioned the virus transition there, I didn't even know it had to do with a virus. I figured it was something kind of post-apocalyptic, but I, I don't quite know what. Yeah, um, that's basically what I knew going into it, is it was some kind of post-apocalyptic, zombie-ish, even though the word zombies is never used in the game, kind of thing. Okay. But if, I think that's kind of how the game was, like, trailers and such presented the game in the first place. So if that's all you know, then, yeah, you're fine going into it like that. This is Naughty Dog, right? The uh, Uncharted people? Yes, it's very different game from Uncharted. I've heard it does that. kind of have some. It has some of the Naughty Dog signature stuff, like the level design is just excellent. Mm-hmm. They do a very good job at you know kind of informing where you're supposed to go with the use of you know colors on platforms and those uh, sorts of things that Naughty Dog typically does. All right. So it has their signature stuff there, but it, you know, <laughs> game wise, it's a completely different game. It's it's very. It's difficult to play at times, not because the game is bad, but because the setting and what you do in the game is so dark and so bleak. It can be hard to stomach so t- sometimes. And it's also, when I was thinking back on it, I think it's probably the most violent game I've ever seen. Whoa. Like, it is... And I don't know if it's because of just the blood and guts and gore the presence of it so much as it is the context with which it is that violence is done, See, if that makes any sense. No, no, no. That makes perfect sense to me. And it's funny that we talked about, it's almost like this was planned, even though it wasn't. Because if you take Harvester, um, no, 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 really. It's a very gory game, but it never, yeah. the actual gore in Harvester never really grosses you out. Well, it's, it's kind of comic almost, like when Steve stabs the paper boy, he just kind of explodes in a yeah, mushy. That, it's just kind of farcical. That there's a lot of that. It's like the Kill Bill kind of thing too, where like Kill yeah. Bill's very violent, but it's kind of cartoony. And there's certain things even like that. Like, do you ever see the movie Dead Alive? No. Um, I think Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings guy, made it. Um, but it's a zombie movie, and it's very, very, very bloody. But it's a comedy kind of, you know. And like at the end, he's like killing zombies with like a lawnmower, and he's like drenched in blood and things like that but it's never hard to watch you know yeah it just feels less real right because yeah when when you add that context to it uh it it really that's what really kind of sells you on something is like vile maybe is a better word for it you know when it's yeah it's something you don't particularly want to experience or look at you know Mm. uh or you ever see the movie hostel no good don't Hostel, okay. I will say, though, is very good. Hostel? At, yeah, you know, H-O-S-T-E-L. No, I was saying, is Hostel Hostel? Yeah, I'd say so. Oh. No, it's a, it's a very hard movie to watch. It's very cringe-inducing, because the stuff they do to it is so brutal, and the people are kind of, like, begging for their lives and heart. You know what I mean? Like, and it's, it, it's, yeah. it kind of defines, like, the whole, quote-unquote, torture porn thing, where it's, yeah. like... Yeah. It's ultimately bad, I think, because it's not scary. It's just like, I don't want to watch this. This is just like a how much can you take kind of thing, but in a really bad way, you know? It reminds me a bit of a show I watched on Netflix, a BB show kind of serial detective cop drama called The Fall. Have mm. you ever seen that? Um, no. So it uh, stars Gillian Anderson. Okay. Is it Gillian or Jillian? I can't uh, 
Jillian. It's not like Snatcher. That's I, how I remember. That's right. <laughs> that's that's right. It's it's yeah. It's it's a pretty hard to watch also because the subject matter is very unrelenting and unforgiving. It's about a serial killer who kills um, kills women, mm-hmm. and it's very very dark. Did these women insult their Good. video games? I don't think because that was the case. If so, then I have sympathy and respect for those serial killers because no one makes mm-hmm. fun of my video games. No, um. Uh, <laughs> I th- th- that's exactly what it is, right? Because you can have these like sort of gory things in it, or like you take the Grand Theft Auto games, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and they usually have this big focus on how violent they are. But there's something unrealistic about them that takes you out of it that you don't feel like you don't feel bad for a person you carjack because it's a pretty unrealistic scenario. You yeah, know? and GTA Five is set up a more of a satirical sort of game, right? But from, what, from what I understand, I haven't played it yet. Yeah, but they're all they're all kind of like that in a way. Like even mm. GTA Four, right. which I guess tried to be a bit grounded, but not really. I mean, you know, you you get hit by a car, you go flying, ragdoll effect. You're in the hospital, it's fine. You know, right? You never you never confuse Grand Theft Auto with the real world. You know what I mean? Well, actually, there was a news story where uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I showed this to you earlier. A uh, person from Alabama who attended Auburn University, War Eagle, uh, he, w- he was going to Baton Rouge, presumably, to see the upcoming football game between LSU and Auburn. And while he was in Baton Rouge, uh, a truck driver pulled up to a, a gas station or something, left his truck running while he went inside. This like 20-year-old college student hops in the car. There's a, a lady in it who he you know forcibly kept in the car. And he just tried to drive away and rammed like nine different cars. And when police finally captured him, and uh, supposedly what the guy said was that he wanted to experience Grand Theft Auto. Okay, but to yeah. defend Grand Theft Auto, what else <laughs> would you say? <laughs> I mean, if you, there is no excuse for that kind of behavior. I, that's it's all totally you not. got is the video game crazy angle. I mean, but that's I think that's the thing when you talk about violent video games and influencing real violence is you get your sort of oddball here and there that you probably would have gotten anyway from other stuff, you know? Yeah, they're already pretty fucked up. Yeah. I don't think the game got them there. That's the thing. And the thing is that these games have only gotten more popular and more prevalent. So you would think you would see some sort of correlative statistics. But as I understand it, violent crimes actually, at least in the United States, has actually gone down. Yeah, over the past decade. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, well, the problem is, though, I think video games tend to be this sort of scapegoat go-to for when things like this happen, you know, shootings and things like that, you want to say. You want to believe that this is a new thing, that the world hasn't always been like this. This is my theory, anyway. So you want to point to something that's kind of new, in a way. You know what I mean? Like you, I think so. It's like, yeah. if, if like something horrific happens, like Columbine or something like that, you don't want to think, God, the world's so fucked up, there are people like this and shit. You want to think... Maybe something has happened that has changed the way people are. So if you pick out a new thing like violent video games, especially like at the time Columbine happened, you know, video games weren't as mainstream as they are now. They were getting there, but you know what I mean? It's easier to point sure. out. Look at Doom. It's this first person thing. The gun's practically in your hand, you know, where it's... People are hungry for easy answers. Yeah, that's exactly especially right. Especially in an age where media is so instant. You can just look up anything, like on your phone or whatever. Everyone wants to have answers to any question they have immediately for that sense of closure and relief. Yeah, and, it, and it, I think it helps, too, if you are if you are part of a generation that didn't grow up with something... To make it, it, it is probably a little comforting to you to say that it's this new thing that wasn't around when you were that's influencing stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Um, this is the bright and sunny part of the podcast, of course. Right. Um, yeah. I but mean, play Last of Us. That's the bottom line. <laughs> okay. Although, you know, I will say, funnily enough, my wife saw a commercial for GTA Five, and she's like, oh, you gotta, you gotta get that. That looks like a beautiful game. Not beautiful. So does that mean you're getting it? Um, I don't know. I think so. I, it's there's so many expenses and things. I really have to ration my video game buying. I so hear you. Yeah, it's coming down kind of between Last of Us and GTA Five. When's the last time you paid sixty bucks for a game? Hmm. I want to say it was somewhat recent, but I can't remember what it was. I paid f- ten, fifteen for Cave Story, but no, I don't think I've played paid sixty for for a game in a long time. 
I haven't either. I always have to get some kind of discount or something because I'm having, you know, getting older, you're just having more trouble rationalizing spending that much money for what is possibly a limited experience when there are other probably more important things you should, you know, focus your finances on. I have another. But I did get Saints Row 4 for oh, 30 bucks today. Hey, that's supposed to be an amazing game. Amazon had a deal and I hopped on that shit. And you haven't played it yet? I haven't played it yet. Uh, Steam just finished downloading it, actually. Okay. I was thinking about hopping on with uh, my friend Psychedelic Guyball, who also has the game for PC, and getting some multiplayer action going. There I hear the game is very fun multiplayer. You got it for PC as well? Yes, PC. Um, and there, there's no like cross compatibility with multiplayer, right? Like if you get uh, like a, a PS3 I, version or. I doubt. The only game I know of that has that cross compatibility is actually Portal 2. Because mm-hmm. I remember I talked to you about doing. Um, or maybe it was somebody else who had the game on PC. I had the game on PlayStation 3 for, uh, for some reason that I can't remember. We, we never finished really? that, did we? Not the multiplayer part, no. We should. We were at the last level, no. if I remember. But. Yeah, we were near the end. Mm-hmm. I think there's DLC for it too now. Oh my God, we should. There's GT. Uh, G- there's DLC for Saints Row Four that is some kind of GTA related thing. Really? And it was free the day it came out, so I downloaded the DLC before I had even gotten the game. But I think it'll think it'll work. <laughs> Curious. I have another thing though too, where I think I think that the game pricing market has been really rocked a bit by like the whole casual gaming and the phone thing. We're now like good games for like three bucks are a possibility. Yeah, know? maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's gotten in my head more that there's cheap ways to have fun. Well, it's like the, there is a um, there's an the iOS gaming yeah. uh, thread in the Something Awful Games forum and for a little while the they changed the title a lot. The joke title was like, is Scribblenauts worth four ninety nine? <laughs> Which is like ridiculous because it's expensive. <laughs> it used to be a fucking $30 DS game, you know? And then they offer it for five bucks. Be like, I don't know, that seems a little expensive. It's like, wow, come on, you know? Yeah, but that's gotta suck for game developers too, because that's that's gotta hurt your revenue pretty fucking bad. Yeah, yeah, it makes me feel kind of bad because when I got, I didn't want to, because I'd asked on Twitter about some different games and I asked, you know, which one of these do you guys think I should play next? And some people said, you know, you can beat Last of Us in a rental, just do that. So I got it from Redbox and I played through the whole game, but only spent like six bucks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Would you buy it? Um, probably. I mean, not now that I've beaten the game, but if I had known what I know now, mm-hmm. I probably would have paid full price. I see. I should check Because it, it, has, it has a multiplayer mode, it has a new game plus, it has, you know, different difficulty modes, so there's probably some replayability in there. Gotcha. Actually, there's a red box by me. I should see if uh, they have Last of Us. I'm kind of interested in that, but that Grand Theft Auto Five, I don't know. Yeah, Last of Us is a little, for me, it was a little shy of 20 hours, like 17-ish, I mm-hmm. want to say. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. But highly recommended. Still got to go back and finish Walking Dead. I have so many fucking games to finish. Yeah. It's not so what's, what's the problem? What, let's psychoanalyze Slow Beef. So well, why can't you finish games? Right now I'm stuck on Cave Story Plus Hard Mode, which I've been streaming. Mm-hmm. I think I talked about that. Did I talk about that on the last podcast? So games you can play in front of the internet take priority over games you play by yourself. It's more like I need to I need to be able to do this just to say that I did it. You know, because it's a very hard, it's a very challenging experience. Because who would you say you do you've done that to? Excuse me. Like, hey, honey, I did it. I can prove it. To like, my, who are you proving yourself to? To myself. Mm. I didn't even know how good I was. That's how I want to say it. I'll show me. Damn. <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, and I'm plus like, it, it, I'm kind of nearing the end. So I have that. Well, I've already waited 20 minutes for this bus type of syndrome, you know? Yeah, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You want to get there? Yeah. And especially because mm. I'm very interested in the final level of Cave Story in general, even without hard mode, is kind of Kaizo ish. <laughs> I forgot what I learned. What Kaizo I'm glad was. that's made it into lamestream lexicon. <laughs> so I'm interested to see exactly how that works on hard mode. But um, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm getting big into that game though. I was even thinking of maybe let's playing it. Um, because then I started watching. There's a 3ds version of the game, which I don't like the way it looks. Really, it's like true 3D, you know. Mm. But how about the 2ds version? Oh, hey. No, no, no. I mean, even in general, like, the 3D polygon models, I don't think, 
look right. I mean, part of the game's charm is it's sort of like got that retro style to it. So take, right. taking that away, I mean, it's fun for a novelty, but I don't know. Would you play Cave Story in IMAX? Oh, yeah, I certainly would. Uh, okay, yeah, well, good. Just for that Balrog toaster guy. I like <laughs> He's him. everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> Still haven't played the game myself. Sorry. You might as well. I mean, it's free. Still haven't played Phoenix Wright either. I... Why won't you play Phoenix Wright? I keep telling you. Still have... What? Well, it's another game I haven't played that you would harp on me on. Uh, still haven't played Sprung. <laughs> I still I would love to talk to someone who made Sprung. Just I want to just pick their brains. Like maybe um, Colleen, what's her face, who wrote it? Do something like why? Like what was? If this game had gone well, what would it have looked like in your head? You know? Why did this teach me so much about dating? <laughs> that was my favorite thing about Sprung too. Is there's the Nintendo Power? Like you know how people could write in. And somebody oh, yeah. somebody wrote it like gave him the confidence to talk to girls. It's like, whoa, good job, Sprung. Just don't bring pepper spray with you. Or right. I mean, I, honestly, Splinter Cell was what gave me the confidence to talk to girls, but mostly just so I could sneak up behind. And them. to be a spy, yeah. Well, <laughs> is there really a difference? I mean, I think. I mean, look at that James Bond guy. I don't know. Actually, you know what that reminds me. I'm supposed to be a great game. Or hmm? an underrated game, or uh, did you ever hear huh? of Alpha Protocol? I've heard of it. It's supposed to be really good. I've heard. It's kind of like um, Mass Effect for spying. Hmm. Like you can play the game as um, the, the three archetypes they give you are like Jason Bourne, James Bond, and Jack Bauer. You know, like so you can play it like the suave, smooth kind of spy, or you're like the kind of ruthless, do anything to get the job done type, or it's like selecting your class. Or the Matt almost. Damon spy. Yeah, basically. I guess so. Mm-hmm. No, I think more like, um, I haven't played the Mass Effects, but you know how you can make Shepard like a really good kind of paragon or kind of a dick or, you know, that kind of thing? Yeah, through the dialogue choices? Yeah, basically. I mean, there's stuff in it that sucks, like bosses, which kind of make no sense in a game like that, as from what I've heard, but yeah, there's actually a Let's Play of it. Um, it's supposed to be pretty good, but I have not watched that on SA. Speaking of which, are there any are there any let's plays you're watching currently? Not at the moment. I'm gonna let's play Dry Spell. I need to catch back up with Psychedelics uh, System Shock thing. Mm-hmm. I just quit watching a while back, but never got back to it. Uh, you know, it's funny. Jazawa Toad, who appeared on our um, our our show thing, we tried help. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Told me today he got like a thousand more views since then. So li- All right. little by little, we helped out. Um, Got, so how do you feel about the help stream? I really, really believe in this idea. Um, I, think, I do too. I think I think what people said, and I agree with, is maybe just a little more prep work on our end. Yeah, no. Okay. And instead of just taking things blindly and hoping good content comes from it. No, totally agreed. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think taking submissions... I still like the whole, um, I guess, American Idol-esque notion of talk to the person and then give them their like last final say or whatever it is you know yeah before executing them yeah so i i don't know how that would go in a pre-recorded type of scenario yeah because then they'd have to be available the only thing i could yeah the only thing i could think of doing is you know we do it ahead of time the assessment talk to them first send it to them and then have them get back to us then you're getting into overly complicated territory right or we do or we um the better way probably is we we pick a few you know, we watch it, we, we pre-do it and all that stuff, and then maybe we do the stream again with those people or whatever if they're available, you know? Hmm. I don't know. Well, I think I think it's it's definitely worth going back to the drawing board for it, but I really don't want to give up on it. I think I... No, I, and I'd like, to, I'd like to do it again for sure. Yeah. In fact, I think after this we should probably tweet, um, give us some... Send stuff. us stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We also need uh, more specific criteria for what they send, I think. Yeah, like no cutscenes... You know, yeah, like, is it, like, um, don't have it just be some random video, but have it be one you actually really want feedback on, or one you don't think went well, and mm-hmm. if you want, just brainstorming on what might make it better, Absolutely. because we're the authority on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we are, though. Yeah, Completely. yeah, yeah. we've earned it, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How have we earned it exactly? <laughs> Just, we put in the time. <laughs> we did our time. 
<laughs> and, and let's play aka Rikers. We got banned from YouTube once. We've been there, man. <laughs> we, in the trenches. We've been in YouTube jail. As it were. You haven't seen what I've seen. <laughs> By the way, um, you were streaming Don't Starve uh, a while back. How did that go? The stream itself was okay, I guess. I don't think the game lends itself all that well to streaming because it's very slow paced. <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, and I, I had a couple of folks on to help me out. Uh, there was Sarah and uh, can't remember the dude's name, but he's a guy who had played Don't Starve a Good Bit. So I had help mm -hmm. throughout, but the game I just didn't like it. What? Well, it's, I so it's kind of a rogue like I I guess I just use that term for anything that has an element of randomness now. Uh huh. I think so, everyone does, to be fair. So fuck you, people. You say <laughs> my otherwise. favorite. My favorite uh, blackjack is rogue like. <laughs> Imagine I said that in the right order. Anyway. You want to go over to Las Vegas, play some roguelikes? There you go. Right. Hey. Well, but it's it's um, it's a survival simulator, I suppose, where you're in this dystopian world, very Tim Burton-esque looking, and you collect wood, very menial tasks, you build campfires and shit, yada yada. You avoid dying, you have to eat, and it's just a... It's just a slog. <laughs> Oh, it sounds wonderful. I mean, it's kind of interesting the first time you play it, but if you get far enough in and you've devoted enough time to accruing the resources and getting um, getting technology and whatnot, and then you die, uh -huh. in roguelike fashion, it starts you completely over again. So now you're back to, all right, well, I had all this cool stuff. Now I'm gathering wood. I'm getting twigs. I'm building a fire. I'm killing rabbits. It's I just had no urge to try again after the first failure. I mean, it does sound like a lot of fun to gather wood. Yeah. Um, the game looks nice. I'll give it that. But just to play, eh. Hmm. Not for me. You know what Cherry Doom... Therefore, it's terrible. <laughs> oh, sorry. You know what Cherry Doom recommended was um, Gone Home. Yeah, I've heard very good things. That's another one I don't know anything about, though. But I I've heard it's gotten a lot of negative reviews, too. Where people are like, it's not really a game or whatever, you know. Yeah, from what I understand, it's just a very story-driven game. Yeah. There's not, like, combat, anything of that sort. You just kind of explore a place and get a story from that. And then it's over. And that's all you, and that's all you need, I guess. Whatever, you know. Boom, video yeah. game. It's an art form, man. Anything can be a game. <laughs> this podcast, you can play it. You can play games. You can play podcasts. Podcast is game! <laughs> oh, that's another thing, by the way. You know that's that why this podcast will be on sale for sixty dollars. <laughs> Six, uh, but then eventually, like, it'll be on the iOS store for three dollars, <laughs> which will be very expensive. Damn Apple! It reminds me, by the way, Infin Infinity Blade Three came out. Speaking of Apple, iOS Seven. All right, any well, thoughts on that as a mobile developer? For forget about my topic, then. Sure, iOS Seven. Um. Yeah, uh, it's the most beautiful implementation of the droid operating system I've ever seen. <laughs> no, um, actually, that's, that's I think, the big assessment. I saw it early at um, WWDC, and uh, I didn't download it because it was very buggy at the time. Um, now that I'm playing more with it, it's it's kind of like they, they cherry-picked a bunch from Android and even Windows Phone. Yeah. I like the typography, um, like some of the stuff about it. There's certain things about it I just don't like. But, um... What do you not like? Um... The new look and feel, they try to make it cleaner, but sometimes I feel like things tend to blend together. New Safari no longer has a search engine in the upper right, which I think sucks because sometimes when you want to just quickly Google something, you know... Well, download Chrome. Oh, well, yeah, no, I can. But, you know, I'm talking about iOS and what comes on board, you know? Oh. Uh... I, I do like the parallax effect. I think that's pretty cool, you know. You Does know. it really murder the battery, though? Um, to be fair, my iPhone 4S is a little broken and already, like, there was something wrong with the battery, so I haven't noticed okay. anything. Um, like, one of the first articles I saw when iOS 7 came out was how not to let iOS 7 destroy your battery yeah. or drain your battery too fast. I've and so I had to go through and make a ton of little tweaks here and there to... Mm -hmm. Like uh, running apps in the background, I think, is a big thing. 
Right, yeah. Well, they do. Especially like anything that's location based. Oh, well, yeah. Any any time yeah. you see that little arrow in the in the top, yeah, yeah. you have to kill that. That nothing needs to choose your battery like GPS radio. Fuck you, NSA. <laughs> <laughs> um I like so I like it ultimately, but you know, I'm still one of those like oh, change sucks kind of people in a way, so, you know. Yeah. I've been I've been pretty fine with it. Yeah, um, you know, though, I, from the inside, meaning the stuff they told us about WWDC, um, everything is supposed to have a kind of physics-y, real-world effect to it. So, like, things mm. have, their apps have, like, gravity now, for lack what? of a better term. Well, I'll give you an example. If you go to your text messages on iOS 7, yeah, and you scroll through them fast, like, you accelerate... And then you decelerate, you know, by holding it. If you look, the word bubbles all move at, like, little different rates. They're kind of, like, springy. Do you have your phone with you right now? I am, but no one texts me, so. No one texted yeah, you on your phone. You have no texts. Well, I have texts, but I don't save them. You really don't know anyone. That's amazing to me. No, Wait. like, why would I need to save texts? I don't know. Sometimes you're like, what did that person hey, say? Hey, remember that time I said I was going to go to the store and asked if you wanted anything? I finally just scrolled uh, to the bottom of my text messages by the, the time we had that conversation. All right. Why do you need to save your text? What is so important that you just don't delete it? Hold on. I'm going to text you right now. Shut up. Okay. Shut up. I okay. love you. Just, okay. Uh, oh, just... <laughs> I only got the shut up part of that text. Well, <laughs> oh wait, no, no, no. no I sent, I sent all multiple came in. of them. It all came in, and now I'm very touched. If you if you move that, I don't know if you can do it if if it doesn't go past the screen. But if you like move them up and down, if you notice the little word message bubbles now, kind of like space out and come closer to each other. Um, I guess you need you need a bunch of messages to really see it. The the notion is though they have sp obviously not visible, but they have like springs between them. So when you move them very fast, they tend to stretch out, and then when you come to a stop, they like bunch up together very briefly. Okay, I kind of see it a little bit. Yeah, like a lot of a lot of the apps are well, actually like that now. If you they have these, wow, that is so interesting. Well, they have these subtle. All right, that's fine. Forget it. <laughs> Whatever. But they all have like bounce and things like that. So there's a physics engine built in, and that's. Not I see why people don't want to pay sixty bucks for games anymore because they can just do this. <laughs> It's a physics engine right in your phone. Incredible. I know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, you, you don't get that on Windows Phone. Do, 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 do you want it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. I don't... I'm, I'm all right with it. I'm still kind of getting used to it, you know. Plus, it doesn't seem like any of the apps I have actually, actually use any of the new iOS 7 stuff, so... Sure. We'll see. At least Maps is fixed. Do you ever know, you know how Maps sucked? You don't use Google Maps? No, I, I meant, like, Apple Maps. Yeah, well, despite that, why would you switch to it? No, 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 I'm saying, uh, when they say it's fixed, it's like, um, did you ever hear about the iOS 6 Maps icon? The little controversy? You know how Apple Maps was screwed? Not, and not the controversy, I just heard that it had, like, farms where... There was oceans. Yeah, like it that. was like a yeah. complete disaster for them. But it was yeah. on the the old icon for Apple Maps um, was like a little direction thing to Infinite Loop, you know, where Apple headquarters is in Cupertino. But the oh. little arrows they drew on the actual icon went like the wrong way on traffic and like took an exit that wasn't <laughs> really there and shit. <laughs> like just how fucked up Apple Maps really was. It's funny because people don't have jobs now. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I'm liking it. I uh, not loving it, but you know. All right. Well, now you can talk about Infinity Blade. That's all I really had. Oh, was okay. that it came out? Did you ever play the original couple of them? When you swing your sword in Infinity Blade, do, does it like bubble closely together and the words kind of have gravity? You know, if you're not going to take this seriously, we should end the podcast right now. <laughs> all right. <laughs>